Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the IGCSE Biology Topics. This is Coordination and Response. Beginning with Stimuli and Response. Stimuli, this is a change in the animal surrounding or in the organism surrounding. And then a response is a reaction towards that change. For example, if you touch something hard, moving away the hand is a response. And the change in temperature was the stimulus. A receptor organ is an organ that detects the change. For example, your eyes can detect change in light intensity. Effector organs perform the effect against the stimuli. For example, a muscle could contract, causing the movement away from danger. And glands can produce secretions in response to some stimulus. The pathway towards detection is the stimuli or stimulus. This is going to be detected by a receptor. The receptor is going to connect through coordination, this is going to involve neurons, and then the effector, which could be the muscle or a gland, are going to respond. Example of stimuli include smell. This is going to be detected by the receptor organ, which is the nose. And then coordination is going to occur in the central nervous system. The effector organs are going to be the salivary glands, and these are going to cause secretions, which is a response, secretion of saliva in response to the smell. Moving on to an impulse. Nerve impulses are information transmitted in the nerve cells in the form of tiny electric signals and then receptors of course we've already looked at this these detect a change in the stimulus or in the surrounding by changing the specific stimulus into electrical energy that is going to be what we call a nerve impulse other examples of receptors here we have the eyes these respond to light the ears can respond to sound as well as to mechanical or kinetic energy the tongue has test birds and these are going to detect chemical stimulation or chemicals or test food. The nose is going to detect smell and this is going to be a chemical signal. The skin is going to be sensitive to mechanical changes. It's also going to be sensitive to heat changes. And of course, muscles, these have stretch receptors. They're going to be sensitive to mechanical as well as kinetic changes or kinetic energy, which could be received. When a muscle is touched, that stimulates many receptors. Of course, a muscle is going to be covered by skin. so. They are going to be touch receptors, pressure receptors, stretch receptors, as well as temperature receptors, and many more. You also need to know that receptor organs can detect change in intensity. For example, eyes can detect change in light, but of course they can detect dim as well as bright light. But also ears do detect sound, but they can detect low sound as well as high-pitched sound. Moving on to the central nervous system, this includes the brain as well as the spinal cord. And of course, the cells within the nervous system are called neurons. We'll look at those neurons later. The nerve impulses that go through these neurons, we've already said these are electric signals, and they are caused by the movement of ions. And again, at IGCSE level, we do not explain how ions cause the electrical signal. This is introduced in A level, but you just have to know that these are going to be caused due to movement of ions in and out of neurons. If this is a membrane of a neuron, ions can move in and out, and those differences in charge can cause a nerve impulse to be generated. Impulses travel at a speed between 10 to 100 meters per second. This 10 to 100 meters per second is quite slow, but it's fast enough to cause rapid response. Impulses from the receptor organs are going to be passed along the sensory neurons, and these deliver the impulse to the central nervous system. The impulses are going to return through the motor neuron towards the effectors, which could be the muscle as well as the gland. And this carries out the effect. And again, you need to remember nerves contain neurons. Neurons are going to be the nerve cells, but they are contained or packaged through nerves. Some nerves only have sensory neurons, while others have only motor neurons. But there are those we call mixed nerves that have both sensory as well as motor neurons. Looking at the structure of a neuron, here I'm using the motor neuron as an example. There are those we call dendrons. Dendrons are extensions of the cytoplasm, and of course this is the cell body, but the extensions of the cytoplasm are called dendrons. And these dendrons have smaller connections called dendrites. These extensions are dendrites, and this one here is the dendron. And then of course we have a nucleus inside the cell body. This one here is what we call an axon, which is the longer extension from the cell body through which the impulse travels from the cell body or away from the cell body. Synapses are going to be junctions or connections between one neuron and another part of a cell body, dendron or dendrite. And like I've already said, axons are extensions from the cell body 
through which an impulse travels away from the cell body towards another area of that neuron. The neuromuscular junction is a connective area where the motor neuron connects towards the muscle. The myelin sheath, like we see here, these are fatty materials and they cover axons. Their purpose is to provide insulation in order to prevent short circuiting. However, they also allow for faster conduction of nerve impulses through the axon. The different neurons here include the sensory neuron. You can see the structure is different. The cell body is towards one side. And here we have the interneuron or what's called the rhythm neuron. The cell body is in the midway through and the motor neuron. The cell body of this is going to be in the central nervous system. For the inner neuron, the whole neuron is going to be inside the central nervous system. And like I said already, the extension of the cell body through which an impulse travels from the cell body is going to be what we call the axon. So in this case, this is the axon. That is going to be the axon. And the others are going to be dendrons, those delivering towards the cell body. So this is a dendron. And in this case, this is going to be a dendron bringing towards the cell body. Moving on to the eye, here we have to learn about structure as well as function. This front part is what we call the cornea. However, the black part behind the cornea is what we call the pupil. That is the area through which light enters, and the diameter of that pupil has to vary in order to allow specific amount of light to enter the eye. Then the next we're going to look at the iris. The iris is what we see here. That is the iris. And this iris is made up of muscles like we're going to see later. It's made up of radio muscles as well as secular muscles. And these aid in varying the diameter of the pupil to let in more light or less light into the eye. We have the lens. This participates in the refraction of light or bending of light in order to focus the images onto the retina. We'll talk about suspensory ligaments as well as the ciliary muscles later on. And their role in accommodation or changing the size of the lens in order to allow images to be focused on the retina. There is also the fovea, this is the region where there is a higher concentration of cones and therefore this is where we have better vision or when an image is focused onto the fovea, it's going to be clearly visualized. The retina is a region where we have the light sensitive pigment or light sensitive cells, the cones and the rods, and that's where light energy is going to be converted into electric signal that can be detected by the central nervous system. And then we have the choroid, this is made up of many blood vessels that supply the eye with nutrients. So looking at the different structures, we begin with the sclera. The sclera in the front becomes the cornea, which you see here, the glass-like material. This is going to be the cornea, but as you move back, it becomes tougher, and this is the white part here. That's what we call the sclera. Then the cornea, like I already said, this is going to be the front part of the eye, and it's a transparent window. The iris is going to be behind the cornea, and of course, this controls the amount of light entering the eye, like I already said, or it controls the diameter of the pupil. The pupil is black to prevent light from escaping inside the eye. The choroid, this is going to be made up of many pigments as well as blood vessels, so it's going to be darker. And it's also going to prevent light from escaping towards the other side. The retina is going to be the innermost layer, like I've already said. It contains the light-sensitive cells or the receptor cells, the rods and the cones that participate in the conversion of light into electrical impulses. And lastly, looking at the optic nerve, this is the nerve through which impulses are sent from the eye towards the central nervous system or towards the brain. Looking at how images are formed, like I've already said, the eye has two light-sensitive cells. One are rods and the others are going to be cones. The rods work better in dim light or are more sensitive when the light is going to be dim. The images are usually black and white. But the cones are sensitive to colors red, blue, and green, and these enable us to see in bright light. Both rods and cones are found throughout the retina, but of course cones are more concentrated around the fovea. That's why when objects are focused on the fovea, we see them more clearly. Due to refraction of light by the cornea as well as the lens, images are going to be upside down like we see here onto the retina, but the brain is going to interpret them backwards so we can see things clearly in the right way. Moving on to the iris reflex, this is very important. This is how the iris varies the diameter of the pupil to allow different amounts of light to enter the eye. Like I already said, the iris has two types of muscles. They are radial muscles as well as secular muscles. In the bright light, we need the diameter of the pupil to decrease. So the radial muscles are going to relax. The secular muscles are going to contract like we see here in this image here. The secular muscles are contracted. 
the diameter of the pupil is going to decrease or the pupil is going to constrict and this is going to cause less light to enter the eye so that the cones and rods are not going to be damaged this allows us to have better vision even if it's bright on the outside in dim light like we see here the radio muscles are going to contract you can see these radio muscles are contracted the circular muscles are going to relax and when the radio muscles contract the diameter of the pupil is going to increase or we say the pupil is going to dilate and when pupils do dilate more light is going to enter the eye so that there is clear vision in this situation the stimuli is light intensity meaning variation whether in bright light or in dim light the intensity of light changes so this is going to be detected by the retina or by light sensitive cells in the retina which are rods and cones information is going to be sent through the optic nerve or through the sensory neurons to the central nervous system where a motor neuron is going to respond towards the fracture which could be the two muscles and the diameter of the pupil is going to be varied the blind spot this is the region where the optic nerve leaves the eye under this region because we do not have rods and cones or light sensitive cells images focused in this region cannot be converted into electric signals and therefore there will be no vision so we call it the blind spot and again for those of you who want to go through the experiment as described in your textbook to visualize the blind spot you can look at that moving on to accommodation this is varying the shape of the lens in order to visualize clearly images that are farther or images that are closer when we observe images that are closer light leaves them in a diverging manner so the lens has to become fatter in order to bend or refract this light so that it can be focused onto the retina for clear vision when we focus on distant images light is going to approach our eyes in a parallel manner so the lens has to become thinner and longer in order to focus the images onto the retina this is when we focus on distant objects and this is when we focus on closer objects when we focus on distant objects the ciliary muscles are going to relax and then the suspensory ligaments are going to be taut the lens is going to become thinner to enable better refraction of light so that we can be able to visualize distant objects when we focus at objects that are closer the ciliary muscles are going to contract the suspensory ligaments are going to relax and then the lens is going to be able to refract or bend the light efficiently for us to visualize objects that are closer and again this is very important accommodation is important in your exams so please make sure you go through this moving on to the reflex arch this is the pathway through which a reflex action goes when there is a stimulus this could be like pain or change in temperature and so on the receptor cells beneath the skin are going to convert that into an electric signal like we can see here this is the stimulus and these are the receptor cells they'll detect the change convert the change that has occurred into an electric signal and this is going to be sent through the sensory neuron you can see the cell body of the sensory neuron is outside the central nervous system so this is going to continue and it's going to synapse with a relay neuron or an interneuron this interneuron is going to synapse with a motor neuron so that the motor neuron brings the information back towards the muscle or a gland in this case this is going to lead to a connection at the neuromuscular junction we see here and then the muscle is going to be stimulated to contract in order to move the hand away from the sharp object in looking at the reflex arch we see there is a dorsal root ganglion this is where we see many cell bodies of sensory neurons and then we can also see there is a ventral root the ventral root is where most of these motor neurons are going to be packaged in the spinal cord white matter is going to be on the outside while gray matter is going to be on the inside you can see gray matter is on the inside and then the white matter is going to be on the outside due to the myelin sheath that is covering some of these neurons going to gray matter and white matter and again i'm going to be talking about within the spinal cord as well as the brain so when we look at the spinal cord the gray matter is going to be found on the inside that's where we have the blood vessels as well as other material and the white matter is going to be found on the outside due to the myelin sheath however in the brain the white matter is going to be found on the inside and the gray matter is going to be found on the outside so during a reflex action a response is going to be very fast impulses do not need to go to the brain however the brain will receive information that something has occurred for example when you step on something sharp you will immediately remove your foot due to a reflex action 
However, the information is also going to be sent to the brain to alert you of the pain that has occurred. And finally, we look at the synapse. So this is a gap between two neurons. Electrical impulses do not directly cross through the synapses. However, they are chemicals that aid the crossing of the electrical impulse. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters are going to be secreted by the neuron through which the impulse is coming from. And then these neurotransmitters are going to go through the gap or they're going to diffuse through the synapse and they will bind onto the next neuron. Then an impulse is going to be studied in that second neuron. And after the neurotransmitter has done its job, an enzyme is going to break it down. And then the products from that breakdown are going to be sent back in the neuron where the neurotransmitter came from. So for example, here we can see this is a neurotransmitter packaged within a vesicle. It's going to cross through the synapse and then bind onto the receptor on the next neuron to cause an impulse to be initiated in that next neuron. And afterwards, an enzyme nearby is going to break it down and then the products are going to diffuse back into the previous neuron where they came from. Some drugs have effects on the synapse or they can affect how synapses work by causing specific sensations if they do cross and bind onto those receptors within the synapse. For example, we have caffeine as well as nicotine. So this brings us to the end of this topic. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.